We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning. Um, I appreciate that. Matt did that to me first service. So it's really awkward to stand here and everybody's just cheering for you. you I haven't even preached yet, guys. You don't even know if it's going to be good, right? So, hey, good morning, ACC. I'm so happy to be here with you. My name is Ryan Vandlin, Executive Director of, of Eastern Dominican Christian Mission. Hey, we are going to be in the book of Colossians chapter 2, so grab your Bibles or your Bible app. And if you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in the chair right here in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, take that one and write your name in it and take it home with you. All right, the guest preacher said you can take the church's Bible. I'm sure they don't mind. Take the Bible home with you. Um, but we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 here in just a few minutes. Eastern Dominican Christian Mission, I tell you what we try to do. We try to do it EDCM. We try to do exactly what you just sang in that last song. Speak the name of Jesus. That's all we try to do. Really, honestly, I don't even need to preach this morning. I just want to say EDCN, that's all we're trying to do is speak the name of Jesus over our family. Speak the name of Jesus over our community. Speak the name of Jesus over the enemy, as that song said. Can I get an amen? amen. And that's really what we try to do. We sum up our ministry in two words, equip and empower. We try to equip national leaders. We teach them that fulfilling the great commission of Jesus Christ of making disciples is not just something for the pastors or the missionaries, it's something for all Christians. And we equip them, we teach them, and then we empower them. We say, go, go and make disciples, go and plant churches. And so currently we have church plants in nine different cities, working in nine different uh, areas all throughout the eastern part of the Dominican Republic. We also have what we call kingdom businesses. These are businesses that, um, that the community needs, that we connect to the church, that we always try to speak the name of Jesus through our kingdom business, such as a school. You're going to hear a little bit about that school today in my message. We have a Christian school that now has over 600 students in that school this year. We have a water plant that provides good, clean drinking water for thousands of people on a daily basis. And we have a, a medical clinic that currently meets inside the church building during the week, and then the church uses the building on the weekends. But we're going to be breaking ground, hopefully October 1st, on building our clinic that's separate from the church building, that's behind the church building, a whole new clinic to com continue providing and reaching, uh, providing the medical needs of that community. We also have what's called the E5 Seminary. This is our Bible seminary, because we're trying to train up leaders. If we're going to equip and empower, we train them up and send them out. And so we have an E5 seminary, and some of that is online, and some of that is in person. Because we're in nine different communities, we have people throughout all those communities in our seminary, and we actually do classes online where they get on Zoom in their communities, and our teachers are from all over the world. And it's really, really cool to think about in the Dominican Republic, we're teaching the Bible online. Oh, yes, we are. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. But ACC, as Matt said, you... You have, we have been with you. You have partnered with us longer than any other global international mission that you support with. And everything I just shared today, all these church plants, all the kingdom businesses, all the baptisms, guess what? You have been a part of all of that. Some of you have actually come down to the Dominican Republic on short-term trips. Some of you were just there earlier this year. And you have actually seen it firsthand. I actually talked to two members of this congregation that have been in this congregation for over 20-some years. And they remember a story that I share today in my sermon. They remember being in that community almost 15 years ago. ACC, you have been a part of everything EDCM and everything I've talked about today. And from the bottom of our hearts, we just say thank you. Thank you so much for partnering with us. Thank you for helping us be able to be in the Dominican Republic and make disciples and equip and empower leaders to make disciples of Jesus Christ. If you want to know some more about our mission, immediately following the third service, so not this service, but the next, immediately following the third service in the cafe, we're going to have a little luncheon. 
If you want to get, I'm going to do a little presentation there and talk about the Go Adventure coming up in 2025 that's coming down to the Dominican Republic. You're all invited. You don't need to sign up. You can just come immediately following the third service. Now, we're in Colossians chapter 2. You've been in Colossians for a few weeks, and I want to continue that theme with you today. But here's a few things you need to know about Colossians. Kind of if you haven't been here for all the other weeks or you've missed a couple, that's okay. <clears throat> I'm going to get you caught up. First of all, the letter of Colossians is exactly that. It's a letter. We think of all Colossians as a book of the Bible. And yes, it is one of the books of the Bible, but it's a letter. Like a lot of the New Testament books of the Bible are a letter. And it's a letter written from a place and for a purpose. Much like if you wrote a love letter to someone, or some of us used to write letters back in the day, you wrote it from a place for a purpose. And this letter is written the same way. It's written by two guys, the Apostle Paul and his disciple Timothy. They kind of co-author this letter. And it's written from prison. Paul is actually in jail. For what? For preaching. For preaching the gospel, Paul is in jail or, or maybe house arrest. It depends. We're not exactly sure where he is in jail. But he's in prison and he's writing a letter from prison for a purpose. So why is he writing a letter? Well, first of all, Colossians is the name of a group of people. They lived in a city named Colossae. All right, this is just a city, a little bit, a couple hundred, maybe like a hundred miles outside of a city called Ephesus, which is another letter in the New Testament, Ephesians, right? So Paul planted a lot of churches on some of his uh, missionary journeys, and he planted a church in, in Ephesus, and one of his disciples there, by the, gay, by the guy by the name of Epaphras, Epaphras from Ephesus. I don't know who gave him. I don't know. You should talk to his parents about naming him that. But Epaphras from Ephesus left, left Ephesus and went over to Colossae and planted a church. And he planted this church, and the Apostle Paul never visited Colossae. Okay? When he writes this letter, he had never visited Colossae, never visited this church. But Epaphras was one of the leaders in the church, and he was trying to run the church and trying to disciple and preaching the name of Jesus and speaking the name of Jesus over everyone. But some people came into that church they were supposedly really, really spiritual, and they started teaching some false teachings. They started teaching some things that went against what Paul spoke on. They started teaching some things that were, they started saying, hey, if you really want to be a Christian, you have to have a deeper knowledge. You have to have special knowledge like we do. If you really want to be a Christian, you have to know the things that we do. And so Epaphras said, oh my gosh, what do I do? So he reaches out to a mentor, Paul. He says, hey, Paul, what do I do? And Paul, from prison, writes this letter for a purpose to say, hey, Epaphras, let me write a letter to your church. Let me tell your church how it is. And you've already studied this, but in chapter 1, verse 23, look what Paul said. Colossians 1, 23, he says, but you, the church, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. For the good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Paul says, hey, we preached you the good news. You've heard the good news of Jesus. You know what it is. Don't go away from it. That same message that was preached to you in Colossae has been preached all over the world. He continues in chapter 2, verse 8, which he studied a few weeks ago. Paul says, therefore, you know, if, if, if we preach you the good news, he says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Hey, that's one of my favorite all-time passages in the whole Bible. Colossians 2, 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. So politicians, got it, got it, right, we got it. Just kidding, this is not a political sermon. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies. These guys were coming into the church with philosophies, some deep thinking. They were empty. They're made up. Some guys are sitting around making this stuff up. It's nonsense. So Paul writes a letter to this church to refute these false teachings. And he said last week, Pastor Matt actually said in his sermon last week, that we have to be rooted in Christ. That Paul says we have to be rooted like, like a big oak tree. Its roots go deep down into the ground. So that when those storms come by, the tree is not just 
knocked over by the storm. We have to be rooted in Christ so when false teachings come or, or hard times come, we don't just get knocked over by the hard times or false teaching. A preacher told, said this once. He said, a proper view of Jesus Christ is the antidote to heresy. The antidote to heresy, the antidote to false teaching is a proper view of Jesus Christ. When you truly understand who Jesus is and what he did, it's the perfect antidote to any false teaching. And if you want to ever look into one book of the Bible to see who is Jesus, what did he do, you open up to the book of Colossians. Because Paul right here in this entire book of Colossians, he says, you want to know who Jesus is? Here's who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is, and a proper view of him is going to be the antidote to heresy. So we're in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let's go with me. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. Actually, I have to stop there. So this version, NLT, says, so don't let anyone condemn you. In the NIV version, it says, therefore, don't let anyone condemn you. Now, any time in the Bible the word therefore is there, you have to ask, why is therefore therefore? What is therefore therefore? You have to ask that, because what does that mean? Usually I say, hey, uh, because of this and this and this and this, therefore, go and do this. Because at ACC we're running out of space, therefore, we're going to start a new service on Wednesday nights. Because there aren't any more parking spots outside on Sunday morning, therefore, I don't have an answer for that one, sorry. But you understand what I mean. And so Paul actually says here in verse 16, therefore, don't let anyone, well, if, if he's saying therefore, what is that therefore, therefore? I'm going to take you right back up. Go up to verse 13. You read this last week. But verse 13 to 15, he says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Verse 16, therefore, see that changes everything, doesn't it? Because of the cross, because of what Jesus did on that cross, because he forgave you of your sins, therefore, verse 16, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels or saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and they are not connected to Christ the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Whew, take a deep breath. You say, what? What Paul is saying is actually pretty simple. You see, these, these, these people were coming into the church of Colossae, and they were saying, if you want to be a Christian, yeah, 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 you've heard the message about Jesus, but you also have to do this festival. You have to go to this feast. You have to abide by this rule and these regulations. You have to do this, 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 and this if you truly want to be a Christian like us. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Because of that right there, because of the cross, therefore, don't let anyone condemn you for not obeying these old festivals or the old ways or the old traditions. No, no, no. Christ is sufficient. Everyone say sufficient. Christ is sufficient. He's all you need. Nothing more, nothing less. You don't have to add anything to the message of Christ. I heard uh, Louis Giglio, pastor down in Atlanta, he said this, we don't need an external addition to make the internal relationship with God everything God wants it to be. We don't need an external addition to make the internal relationship with God everything God wants it to be. You see, we don't have to add anything to the message of Jesus. We don't have to add external things, festivals and feasts or anything else in order 
to make that internal relationship with the creator of the universe any stronger. What Christ did on the cross for us is sufficient. Christ is sufficient. We have, through the cross, we have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Think about that. God spoke the universe into creation, and through the cross, we are allowed to speak with him and listen to him. He wants a relationship with us. We don't have to add anything to it. So Paul says Christ is sufficient. In the Dominican Republic, where we work, the Roman Catholic Church has a strong grip on the culture. Now, the, the Catholic Church in the Dominican Republic is very different than the Catholic Church here in the United States, and I don't have time to go into all of that. But the Roman Catholic Church, they, they have a strong grip on the people of the Dominican Republic. And they have many, many, many traditions and, and, and rituals that you have to ob obey, you have to abide by if you want to be a true Catholic. One of those is in a city that we work in, a city called Igüey. There's a huge basilica. Now, the basilica is just the, uh, the uh, big Catholic cathedral. And then lots and lots of people, every year on Easter weekend, they make the journey, their pilgrimage to this cathedral to do one thing. They line up throughout the huge cathedral all the way down the road, and they come up here to the stage, and right here is a huge picture of Mother Mary. And they all come up, and they, they, they pray their blessings, and they ask Mother Mary to bless them. And they come up and they say whatever they say and then they go down the steps and the next person comes up. I literally have seen someone, it was a mother, and she was at the very outside of the church building at the steps and she knelt down and she had a cake, like a birthday cake, a big cake. And it just said, happy birthday, whomever. And I saw her kneel down and pray and then she got up and she walked all the way through, went all the way up here and prayed to Mary and was asking Mary to bless her five-year-old son. Mary, would you please bless him? And then she walked down this way, and she left the cake over here. And that was her way of asking Mary for blessings, rituals, and traditions. The Roman Catholic Church preaches all the time to the Dominicans, hey, if, if, you, don't, if, if you are in need, you need to pray to Saint whomever. If you are, are, are not fertile and you want children, you need to pray to Saint whomever. They have Saint Peter, Saint John, Saint Paul. They have all the saints. Some of you actually maybe have even grown up with some of this. But what Paul is saying here is, brothers and sisters, you don't have to abide by traditions and rituals like that anymore because of the cross. Jesus is sufficient. He is sufficient. He's enough. He's all you need. You don't have to add to it. And in this church in Colossae, people were trying to add to that message. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You don't have to add to it. Those people aren't even connected to Jesus Christ, the head. They're making this stuff up. It's nonsense then Paul continues in verse 20 you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world isn't that powerful you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world so why do you keep on following the rules of this world such as don't handle and don't taste and don't touch such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because we require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Now, there's a whole lot in there, and I'm not going to go through each and every one of those. But what Paul is saying right there is if we are truly made alive in Christ and we're free in Christ, why are we letting all these other traditions and all these other things hold us back from being alive in Christ. Don't let those things hold you back. Be alive in Christ. Christ is sufficient and Christ is supreme. Everyone say supreme. supreme. Christ is supreme. Now, when I say the word supreme, I think we all kind of know what that means, right? I mean, that's a word we use. Um, but I, I wanted to look it up. Like, what is the official definition of supreme? So Webster says this. Supreme, superior to all others. That's all it said. I was like, you know what? I really like that definition. Superior to all others. And Paul is saying, guess what? Christ is supreme. Christ is superior to all others. Now, in our culture here, we think of supreme, things that are supreme. 
right? I think of the Supreme Court, right? We have lots of courts and lots of justices, lots of judges, but these are the supreme ones. They are superior to all others. What they say goes for our country. Everybody else is inferior, okay? When we talk about music, some of you like rock and roll music, some of you like country music, some of you, bless your hearts, like rap music, some, just kidding, there's lots of different kinds of music. What, what, which type of music is supreme? Which band is superior? Of course, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Right? How many of you have no idea who that is? Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Google it. They thought they were supreme, evidently, okay? And we can sit here and have fun. We can say, hey, what's the, what's the most supreme type of cookie? Is it chocolate chip? Is it oatmeal raisin? Is it macadamia? But we all know it's chocolate chip and the gooey ones, right? We know those are the supreme. How about, how about, how about ice cream? Vanilla? Chocolate? Strawberry? No, it's moose tracks. We know it's moose tracks, okay? And don't do that one where, whatever it's called, where they mix them all together, vanilla, chocolate, man, that's terrible. That's, yeah, that one, Napoleon or whatever it's called, right? <laughs> Napoleon one. How about Pizza? You like sausage, you like pepper, how about supreme pizza? It has everything on it. It is superior to all the rest, which is what supreme. Now, do we have any sports fans in the room? I'm I'm a big basketball guy. I love basketball. Um, And my NBA team is the San Antonio Spurs. So if you don't know anything about basketball, don't worry. You don't need to root for them. We only have one player. But I love the Spurs, and there has been times, there have been times when the Spurs were superior. They were supreme. They They were so good. And it was so much fun being a fan back then. Or maybe if you were in the 90s, you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls, right? They were just superior to everybody else. How about NFL, football, right? I see a lot of jerseys around here. Now, I know, I know where we are. I know what city we're in. I know where, where we are. Therefore, I, I know who the supreme team in the NFL is, the, super, the one that's better than everyone else. We all know are the Kansas City Chiefs. Like, we know that, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm sorry, right? And before, oh, he's leaving, he's leaving. (laughs) Now, (laughs) and I'm just joking. I know where I am. I know it's the Baltimore Ravens, okay? I know it's the Ravens. Um, Just Ravens, it's time to win. It's time, like, come on, let's go. Now, to be honest with you, I'm a Washington fan, so I'm not even gonna brag on my team at all, so don't even worry about it. Okay, but we're talking about being supreme. And what Paul, let's get back to seriousness, all right? What Paul is saying is Christ is supreme. He's sufficient and he's supreme. He's superior to everything else. He's at the top. He's all by himself. He is the best. He's all you need and he's at the top. There's no argument. And if something is supreme, if it is superior to all others, what do we do? We listen to it. We follow it. We obey it. We submit to it. In this case, the it is not an it, it's a he. His name is Jesus. We listen to him. We obey him. We submit to him. Why? Because he is supreme. He's superior to all others. We don't have to add to him or take away from him all by himself. He is superior to all others. And Paul connects that right here saying, if you believe that, if you believe that Jesus is supreme and Jesus is sufficient, then why are you allowing what some of these people in your church are saying, why are you allowing that to affect your faith? Why are you allowing some of their old rules of like, hey, you have to do this festival and this feast, why are you allowing that to affect your faith? Because honestly, brothers and sisters, Christianity isn't seasonal. Christianity is daily. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me at Christmas and at Easter. No. Take up your cross and follow me twice a year, three times a year. No. Take up your cross and follow me daily. Everybody say daily. Daily. Take up your cross and follow me daily. If Christ is supreme and Christ is sufficient, you're going to take up your cross and follow him daily because he's superior. He's supreme. And Paul already told you, I read In chapter 1, verse 23, he says, Because of this message that I've preached to you, he tells the church, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. And this good news that I've preached 
has been preached all over the world. And it's still being preached all over the world today. Can I get an amen? amen? I'm standing here in front of you today representing Eastern Dominican Christian Mission. Where this is the message we've been preaching in the Dominican Republic. We preach in Spanish, we preach in English, and we preach in Creole, which is the native language of the Haitian immigrants coming over from Haiti. And we preach the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Day in and day out, we try to speak the name of Jesus over the communities in which we work in. Let me tell you about one of those communities. Several years ago, when my wife and I were just starting there in the Dominican Republic, we were partnering with another missionary that was about to retire. His name was Rick. And Rick said, hey, Ryan, I really think God has laid on my heart to go and plant the church in this area over here. I said, okay, well, take me out there. We went out there and we got there and said, hey, Rick, what's the name of this community? And, and Rick said, this is called Plywood Village. I said, oh, okay. So I got out there and here's what I saw. When I came down the street, I saw a, a, a dirt street, no paved roads. On both sides of the street, I saw sewage on both sides of the street. And little children in very little clothing jumping back and forth, back and forth, acting like it was a game, jumping over the sewage. I saw drugs. I saw drug deals on every single corner. The drugs were rampant. I saw little teeny stores called Colmados. They're on everywhere. And what they did is they got a big speaker, like this big speaker right here, and they turned the volume up as loud as they can, and they had blare music trying to attract people to come to their store to do one thing, to drink until they got drunk. Their message was, hey, come here, we'll fix all your problems. Just drink until you can't feel them anymore. Till tomorrow. I saw a community full of, of marital unfaithfulness. Men that had moved from other cities had come out this way to get a job. And since they've been out there, they do anything they want with whomever they want. I remember that night, I spent the night there. And, then, um, and, and in the middle of the night, about 2 or 3 in the morning, I heard a lot of noise out in the street. I said, I'm going to have to go see what, what's going on. So I, you know, I get out and I go out to the street to see what's going on. And two men that were completely drunk had machetes and they were brutally mutilating each other as they fought. I went back to bed and the next morning I got up and I, I went out to that same street where those men were fighting. I had my cup of coffee. I looked to the right and I looked to the left. At this point, there's no music. It was quiet. Nobody was out yet. And I thought to myself, this place is hopeless. Like who in their right mind would ever want to work here? This place is hopeless. And about that time, the missionary came up with his cup of coffee. He said, yep, God's really laid on my heart. We need to plant a church here. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> Little did I know he was right. So what we did is we began to make plans. We bought the piece of property where we were sitting that day, right there on that main street. We, we, we put a concrete slab and we put one of those big wedding tents, those big white wedding tents there, and we called that the church building. We started offering uh, uh, services for, for women. We'd bring women in and we'd teach them how to crochet or sew. We had sewing machines, teach them how to sew. And as we're teaching them how to sew, we're speaking the name of Jesus over them. We're teaching them the Bible. We start bringing in children for VBS activities, teaching them the name about Jesus. Then we started having Sunday evening service in the Dominican. It's common to have church at Sunday night, not Sunday morning. So we started a Sunday, morning, a Sunday evening service. And before you know it, someone came and gave their life to Christ. And we baptized them just like you saw this morning. And then a second person, and then a third person, and a fourth. And before you know it, we had 30 or 40 people gathering every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening. And guess what? That's called a church. Now, one of the first things the church did is they got on their knees every single day. And they prayed because on the front section, on the left side right here, if this is the entrance of the church right there, connected to our property was an active brothel. And the church prayed every single day, God, would you please rescue those women and close down that brothel. Now that is something that just never happens in the Dominican Republic. <coughs> Brothels are active. They're productive. They make a lot of money. They don't ever close down. The government never sends in police to close them down. After three months of praying on their knees every single day, you know what happened one night? 
One night, the police pull up, and it wasn't just the police. It's the military police, and they have all their, their gear on. They have helmets on and everything. They came in with their, their machine guns. They knocked down the door. They rescued all the women. They arrested all the men, and they shut it down. The church began to pray for all those little colmados that were blaring the music. One by one, Lord, would you shut them down? Would you shut them down? And one by one, they started closing except for the one that was directly across the street from our church. They would blare the music so loud that when our worship team was playing and preaching, even in our speakers, our church couldn't even understand what we were saying because their music was so loud. So you know what the church did? Pastor Franklin wrote a very respectful letter, and he walked across the street, and he took it to the owner of that colmado, and he said, Hey, we have church services on these days at these times. Is there any chance you could just turn your music down just a little bit so we can have church services? And that owner said, I am so sorry. I hope I haven't offended your God. Tell me what time your church services are and I'll make sure that music is turned off. And he did. Every time, hey, we have five church services a week, so that's a lot, right? Every time we had church service, they would turn their music completely off so that we could have church. So as we began to work there, the church began to grow little by little. Pastor Franklin, he looked at me, the Dominican pastor, he looked at me and said, Ryan, I think God's laid on my heart. I said, oh no, here it goes again, <laughs> right? I think God's laid on my heart that we need to build a school. I said, Franklin, we, we're trying to build a church. Why do we need to build a school? I don't know anything about schools. I don't, I don't do schools. He said, I know, I don't either. But God's telling me we need to build a school. Look at this article. And he passed me a news, a news article. And it said that in Plywood Village, there were 5,000 school-aged children. 3,000 of those children were not in a school. That the public schools were full. They had 65 children per one teacher in all the classrooms. There was no more room. And the news article saying, who's going to do something about it? We got 3,000 kids that aren't in school. So Franklin and I, in that very moment, I said, well, I, I think you're right, Franklin. We need to plan a school. So we began to make preparations. And Franklin, his wife, and my wife, man, I love her so much, she planted that school and started that school. Now, the first day, I thought we'd start with 20 or 30 kids, you know, just to do something small. We opened up registration. We had a line from here all the way out our whole property and all the way down the street of parents trying to register their kids to come to our school. We had to cap it at 108 kids that first year. We didn't have any more room. We only had three classrooms. And since then, it went from 108 to about 250, then to about 423. And we have over six, um, I think 650 kids this year right now in our school receiving a Christian education and hearing the good news about Jesus Christ every day. Can I get an amen? And as this happened, as the, the neighborhood began to transform, the government came in and they paved the roads. And they put sidewalks in to get rid of that sewage. And all those little colmados started shutting down. The police started actually policing. And the drugs started to disappear. The crime started going down. We began to see a true transformation right before our eyes. As I mentioned in between services, a couple of your members that have been a part of ACC for a very long time, they were in Plywood Village 15 years ago. And when I told this story first service, they're like, oh yes, we remember. We remember. And here's what I told them. You need to come back. You need to come back. Because it's a completely different place now. You see, several years ago, the government came back to Plywood Village. And they were just doing that. The politicians just came in to see about Plywood Village. And when they came in, like I did 15 years ago, here's what they did. They drove around. They were driving on paved roads. They saw sidewalks. They saw a three-story school with 600 kids. They saw a church building, not a tent anymore, but a church building. They saw houses, not plywood houses. They saw something completely different than I did 15 years prior. And they pulled into our property, and they talked to Pastor Franklin, our Dominican pastor. They said, Franklin, why is this place called Plywood Village? Why does it have the name Plywood Village? And Franklin just smiled. He said, well, you should have been here a few years ago. And the government said, no longer shall this place be called Plywood Village. We're changing the name. We're going to give it an appropriate name. No longer is this place called Plywood Village. From now on, you will refer to this place as Villa Esperanza. 
or the village of hope. Why? Because Christ is sufficient. Because Christ is superior. You don't have to add anything to his message. You don't have to take anything away. It's sufficient for all of us. It's sufficient for you. It's sufficient to transform Plywood Village. So ACC, as you do every single week on the stage, I ask you, so, so what now, God? What now, God? Here's what now. One question for you today. Is Christ supreme in your life? Is Christ supreme in your life? Not the person next to you on your right or the person to your left or the person behind you. Don't think about them today. I want you to think about you. What do I mean by that? Is Christ supreme in your life? Supreme is what? Superior to all others. Is Christ superior in your life to your job? Is he superior in your life to how much money you're making? Is he superior in your life to which NFL team you're cheering for? I sure hope so. Is he superior in your life in your priorities? Is Christ supreme in your life? Because the message that Paul is writing to the book of to, to, to the people of Colossae is that Christ is sufficient and Christ is supreme. And that message is for each and every one of us here today. And when you make Christ supreme in your life, when you really, like we just saw here just a little bit ago, this woman said, hey, I'm going to get into the waters of baptism and say that Christ is sufficient. Christ is supreme. I'm going to make him superior to everything else in my life. This is what I'm doing. When you do that, he transforms. Just like he did in Plywood Village. If he can transform a whole village, think about what he can do in your life. But you got to make him supreme. He is sufficient. You don't have to add to the message. You don't have to take away. He's sufficient. And he's supreme. So I want to ask you today, before you leave, just have a moment with God. I'm going to pray for us, and maybe this is the time you need to do it. Just have a moment and say, God, are you supreme in my life? Have I made you supreme? Are you first? Are you superior? Or do I need to kind of fix my priorities a little bit and make sure you're number one up there at the top all by yourself? Because I challenge you to do that today. Whether you've been a Christian for a long time or maybe you've never said, Jesus, I want you to be number one in my life. I want you to take me and transform me. Today might be your day. I'm going to pray for us this morning, and then Pastor Matt is going to close us out. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for this word that you've spoken to us through Paul and Timothy in this letter. Lord, I pray right now that you help each and every one of us to make you superior, make you supreme in our lives. Help us to put you first. Help us not to be so so caught up in in, in making the next dollar or moving up the, the chain at work or whatever it is that distracts us. I pray, Father, that we put you first, that we make you superior to all others because we know you already are. Help us to make you supreme in our lives. Father, I thank you for transforming Plywood Village. And I pray, Father, that I'm alive long enough to see that happen 10 10 more times, 50 more times. And I thank you for transforming ACC and this community that they live in right here. And I pray, Father, that as we go out here today, that you would help this congregation to go out and preach your supremacy and preach your sufficiency to a world that needs to hear it to a world that sometimes is still trying to do whatever they think they're supposed to do to please you, God, and all they have to do is humbly give their lives to you and let you transform them. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this word. In the name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.